Welcome to our new series of interviews and updates about the Campbell Collaboration. In our second author interview, we're talking to Rigmor Morberg about the systematic review she wrote with Eva Dennison titled Interventions to Reduce the Prevalence of Female Genital Mutilation or Cutting in African Countries. Rigmor, welcome to our Campbell Collaboration author interview series. I'd like to begin our talk today by asking you about the review which you and Eva Dennison did, focusing on the issue of female genital mutilation or FGM. I wonder if you could tell us first what FGM is and perhaps a little bit about the scale of this problem. Yeah, sure. Uh, so FGM is the cultural practice of modifying women's genitalia. In most cases, this means cutting off parts of the external female genitalia. As to how many uh, people are affected or how many girls and women are affected, well, there's a recent UNICEF report uh, indicating that around 140 million girls and women alive today have undergone FGM. It's also estimated that each year about 3 million girls are at risk of undergoing this practice. If we look at where FGM is concentrated, it's in a band of 27 African countries, and that's a band which stretches from the Atlantic coast to the Horn of Africa and to Iraq and Yemen in the Middle East. The prevalence of FGM is particularly high in Somalia, Guinea and Egypt. In these countries, over 90% of all girls and women undergo FGM. What questions did you set out to address? Efforts to end FGM have relied on two arguments. First, that it's a violation of women's human rights. And the second is that it involves physical and mental harm. Intervention efforts to reduce the extent of FGM have been initiated in many areas of the African countries where the practice is concentrated. What we found, however, was that there were no systematic reviews that examined the effectiveness of interventions within a perspective of context and explanation of success or lack of success. So um, Eva and I decided to conduct a realist review to examine the effectiveness of FGM prevention programs and identify which factors facilitate and hamper the success of such programs. Could you give me a brief summary about the key findings of this review? Yeah, certainly. We identified and included eight controlled effectiveness studies and an additional 27 studies which could help explain the relative success of the interventions. Now, unfortunately, this means that we could only to a small extent conclude how factors related to the abandonment of FGM help to explain the effectiveness of interventions. Uh, but we did find that there were possible advantageous developments as a result of these FGM prevention efforts. We found that all of the interventions were based on a theory that says that the dissemination of information improves the way people think about FGM and that the success of these interventions also depend on different contextual factors. So, for example, we found that in context or areas where FGM and Islam are closely related, the failure to involve religious leaders and base the program on the receiving community's needs and wants led to low program attendance and also to high dropout. You noted in the review that there is a shortage of information and research about FGM interventions. That must affect the choices policymakers need to make. Yeah, well, I think there's particularly two ways. So on the one hand, it means that policymakers doing FGM-related work have a much tougher time deciding on which intervention programs to prioritize. If there's a shortage of high-quality data on which to make policy decisions, that's going to be a problem. On the other hand, you could argue that a lack of data is going to encourage policymakers to push for more and better research in this area. And I would argue that in the long term, this could lead to the building of a more solid research base for their policy decisions. Let's turn now to talking about the topic of FGM in more detail. I want to start by reflecting on FGM being a challenging subject. With this in mind, I wondered how one sets about measuring the success of interventions to reduce FGM. Do interventions need, for example, to take place over long periods of time in order to detect change? How does one gain the trust of those communities who are practicing FGM, both short and long term? Ooh. Well, you're right. FGM is a challenging subject to research in many ways. One reason for this is that FGM is a deeply entrenched and highly valued tradition among certain ethnic groups. 
girls and families conforming to the practice acquire social status, respect and community membership. But then there are also those who find that the practice violates women's rights and carries too many health risks to be justified. So in other words, FGM is a centuries-old practice and it's one that a lot of people wish to continue, but it's also one that a lot of people want to have abandoned. So when it comes to investigating the effectiveness of abandonment programs, researchers must consider the ideological contestation of the practice of FGM and they must be aware of this. The most trustworthy evidence that an FGM abandonment program is effective is that a community has stopped FGM. In other words, it's, there's been a change to fewer or no girls undergoing FGM. Clearly, if you're going to measure such a change inside a community, a study is going to have to collect data over many, many years. Evidence of change towards abandonment can also be detected, or I would argue at least signaled, by examining people's intentions to continue the practice, as well as their attitudes towards the practice. People's intentions and their attitudes say something about the likelihood of them behaving a certain way. With respect to your question about gaining the trust of communities, I think it's absolutely essential to gain the trust of the communities in which one is seeking change in FGM practice. Firstly, it's logical that people are going to be more inclined to listen to what you have to say if and when they trust you. And secondly, in our systematic review, we found that the program that had project staff or that were implemented by an organization that was trusted by the target communities, it was those programs that were more accepted by communities and tended to achieve better results compared to those that did not have the trust of communities. And now with regard to how one gains trust, I think there are many possible ways to achieve this, uh, but a precondition of complex health programs involve, involving behavior changes is the need to gather appropriate and enough data to inform the development of a program. One needs to know that a program fits or matches a target community's characteristics. So what I'm trying to say, I guess, is that thorough program planning is essential if one is going to learn and understand what will create trust. What's critical for building trust in one community may not be critical in another community. In our Campbell Systematic Review, uh, we found that a lack of knowledge and understanding of the target groups as well, sort of key features or characteristics was related to how much trust was achieved. Interventions embedded in existing reproductive health projects, for example, those that were implemented by locally trusted agencies that appear to be neutral, it was those interventions that experienced fewer problems and were more successful. So in essence, it's a researcher's knowledge of a target community that can help to ensure a good fit between an intervention and the characteristics of the target community. So we would argue that ways of establishing trust should be part of a rigorous program, um, program planning phase. This review uses a realist synthesis methodology. I wondered if you could tell me more about what a realist review is and why you decided it would be better to use this approach when studying the subject of FGM. So what's known as a realist synthesis or realist review um, uh, well, realist review is a relatively new way of conducting reviews. It's a theory-driven approach, and its working assumption is that a particular intervention triggers particular mechanisms of change. Mechanisms may be more or less effective in producing their intended outcomes, depending on their interaction with various contextual factors. The interactions are called context mechanism outcome configurations, in other words, what realist reviews are trying to uh, answer is which mechanisms are causing which outcome under which circumstances. A realist review has an explanatory focus and this takes context into consideration and it tries to explain what makes certain programs work or why they fail in a specific setting. Reviews based on a realist perspective can use studies based on both qualitative and quantitative data. Uh, 
It reviews the results of previous studies so as to identify, articulate, test and refine program theories. Eva Denison and I decided to use a realist review methodology because we believe the effectiveness of FGM abandonment programs was likely to be highly context dependent. We also believed that examining the relevance of the interventions would allow us to learn about the conditions that are needed for FGM abandonment programs to work. And by arriving at some answers about what factors are important for FGM abandonment programs to be successful, we also believed that our review would be more useful for other researchers, funders, uh, and also decision makers. A final question. Would you say that you're positive about what has been achieved so far? And do we have any reason to be optimistic about what can still be achieved in reducing the prevalence of FGM? Change in the practice of FGM is slow. Yes, I think we must acknowledge that. But uh, I believe there are reasons to be optimistic that fewer girls will undergo FGM in the next generation. The issue is gaining international awareness. There's also quite a lot of research being conducted, and we must also remember that survey results indicate a decline in prevalence in some countries. <clears throat> UNICEF's latest estimates from those countries that have surveyed the prevalence of FGM more than once show a dramatic decline in prevalence, for example, in the Central, Central African Republic. In that country, FGM dropped from 43% in 1994 to 24% in 2010. There's also been a decline in FGM prevalence in countries like Kenya, Eritrea, and Mali. So, yes, with sustained efforts and appropriate amendment programs, I think we're moving towards a time when fewer girls risk undergoing FGM. Rigmor, thanks for sharing your insights about this Campbell Review. I hope we'll be talking with you again soon. This video was produced by the Campbell Collaboration. Find out more about the collaboration and the work we do by visiting our website at www.campbellcollaboration.org.